Welcome to Spiritual Studies Session 58. Today is a focus on hell. <laughs> the investigation of this session is to talk about where we get this idea. In the modern world, and especially in the past of Western civilization, there is this weird preoccupation, worry, guilt, anxiety, dread that comes along with this idea of hell. What, what awaits, you know, um, this idea of fire and brimstone and suffering that if you don't act right, you have reason to fear what is to come. And so this session is about where did we come up with this and what are the effects of this? Why have we done this to ourselves? You know, this didn't come from nothing. Um, so we're going to track the history of this idea and compare it to its neighbors, compare it to the different concepts that humans have ascribed um, to the afterlife. And this hasn't, as we'll see, this idea hasn't come from nowhere, but <clears throat> it's certainly not the only way that we can talk about it. So we begin with etymology, as we do. Hell, from Old English, the netherworld, the infernal regions, a place of torment, um, wickedness after death. From the Proto-Germanic, meaning the underworld, which is a very nebulous term. And as we take it back and back and back, we see its derivatives in Old Saxon, in Old High German, in Old Norse, in Old Frisian. It just means concealed place. Cave, cavern, the Proto-Indo-European root kel, to cover, to conceal, This would have a seeming immediate argument, uh, a tie to Helheim of the Nordic tradition. However, this is very rough because Helheim was not a place of suffering. The daughter of Loki, Hel, who rules over Helheim, which was also thought to be equivalent to, if not the same as Niflheim, Nifl meaning mist, the realm of mist, notice the immediate difference, uh, was a place that shares this name, but was a place of abundance in the afterlife, was not spoken extensively by a Nor the Norse pantheon, but it was effectively just another world. <clears throat> People would eat, they would sleep, they would fight, they would live basically the same as they lived here. It was just the other side, the underworld. So right away, I want to make this point. To enter the ancient mind, you are at a source of water, and you look in this clear water, and you see the reflection that everything that is above you, as you see it, is now below you in the reflection. This is the underworld. You can see it. It's under you, and there's a world under you. So why would this be negative? It is a reflection, right, of the other side. Now, again... Here we are in the ancient mind. Where does the sun go when it dips below the horizon line? Well, by your eye, it goes under. It goes into the under world. So it would be a mirroring, right? It's a mirroring of this world. That is effectively just the other side of the coin. There's nothing different about it. It's just a reflection. Anyhow, 
So the Norse didn't have this, but it shares this name. So we call it hell. But if you want to notice with me right away that this is a misnomer, right? Because when the Christians were coming and they were looking for this translation in English, they took it from here, right? They took it from hell because that's the underworld, but it doesn't resemble it. So when we say burn in hell, <laughs> you know, you can see how conflated that really is if we take it linguistically. Now, what we're more reacting to here and what the Christians are coming with is more of this Sheol, more of this Hades, and more of this Jahannam, which we're going to get to all of that. But I want to talk first about Dante's Inferno. And so this really was this painting of this idea for the Western mind, really. But what isn't really mentioned a lot is, you know, this is a very serious subject, right? All these uh, different levels of hell. But what you need to understand as somebody who maybe hasn't gone through this material is this is the divine comedy. It's a comedy in a very tongue-in-cheek kind of way. I mean, Dante, it's Dante's Inferno. It's not uh, Christianity's canonical Inferno. Uh, Dante is putting popes that he doesn't like in hell. Dante's putting whoever he wants in hell for, for whatever political purposes he finds or, you know, personal. <clears throat> and he's also using hell in the greater narrative through the Paradiso and the Purgatorio, I believe, um, as a story of his own spiritual development. So right away, you know, this carving of like the, the horrors and the body horror and the atrocities and the like literal depictions of what hell is like, it was made out of a comedy written by a poet who has really and a really weird relationship with Christianity. But people take this stuff so seriously. So let's dive into that seriousness, right? So in Judaism and through the Hebrew Bible, there is this term Sheol, which, which derives back into the more ancient Jewish understanding of this before the idea of the word, you know, hell comes along. And it's a place of darkness where dead people go. Everybody goes there, though. Everybody goes to Sheol in this ancient way, in this particular interpretation through Judaism. Because as we talked about before on the Course, Judaism also has a relationship with reincarnation and tends to be rather nebulous in the conversation of what the afterlife entails. Um, the rationale being to fixate on what the afterlife um, is, is taking you away from the point the point of what this life is, is to follow God. But if you are following God in the precondition that you will receive something for it in the afterlife, then you're not really following God. You are making it conditional. You're making it transactional. And that is not a genuine following of God. So thus, the this, this story or the conversation of the afterlife becomes rather conflated. Anyhow, Sheol, everybody goes there. The good, the bad, they all go to this shadowy place, regardless of who you are, regardless of how you are, and you're cut off from life, from God. The inhabitants of this place, Sheol, are known as shades, shadows, which goes into the ancient understanding of both, we could talk about like, Ghosts, you know, we could talk about poltergeists, we could talk about um, ghosts, you know, being shadow figures, the shadow people. We could talk about the shadow understanding in ancient shamanism, how everybody has a shadow, what it means to have a shadow. New Age um, spirituality could talk about Jungian psychology and the shadow, and they're known as shades, that you become the shades which this is a kind of uh, reverberation of your former self, not quite you, a kind of faulty person. And 
This is uh, thought to be, this is a reference to the Witch of Endor, too, when the Witch of Endor seemingly, uh, in the Bible, uh, manages to pull off necromancy. An argument in this interpretation is that it's, in fact, not necromancy because the Witch of Endor is simply um, conjuring the shades, which is a weird kind of canonical thing, you know? And I I guess I should correct myself in the course. I think in the Burning uh, Times talk, I said that witch doesn't occur in the Bible when I did miss this reference, actually, to the Witch of Endor. And I think it's very fascinating. It's something I'd like to dive into more. Um, Anyhow, so this is a place, a permanent place for all the dead, where people are mere shadows of their former selves. Uh, so where is hell in this, right? Because it doesn't quite resemble what we're looking at, being that it is for all people. This is much more uh, reminiscent of Hades in a certain way, but we'll get to that. And, you know, since it's for everybody, uh, that's, that's a real throwout. It's pretty damning. It is a place of punishment in a certain way. But there's also this equivalent, which is Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A, which is also another reference that we'll talk about some, but uh, when it comes to the translations of hell in the Bible or when we're working at these references, it is either going to be Sheol, Hades, or Gehenna, depending on what particular reference you're looking at. So are all these three different terms the same thing? Or are they different things? Because as it is translated, Sheol happens 65 times. And sometimes it's translated as, most often, the grave. It literally means the grave, when they are in the grave. Uh, It means hell, as it's understood, 31 times. And then it means the pit, which is something else, or maybe the same, three times. But Sheol, you know, is the most common reference in the Bible itself. Hades is thrown in there at certain times. Now, another interesting, and Gehenna. Um, Gehenna seems to be a reference to specifically the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the deepest part of hell, canonically or in the understanding interpretation of classic Christianity, uh, the place where Satan was casted along with the angels during, you know, or after the rebellion. Now, an interesting thing to go into is that there is an interpretation that Sheol is an ancient reference to a deity in that sense that Hades is a reference to both the place and the deity. It is uh, both at the same time. And this was uh, also seen in Sumerian, but could also feasibly, by a certain interpretation, be interpreted in the term Sheol. Now, when we were talking about the ancient Canaanites, there's a weird relationship between the polytheism that was the inciting grounds for Judaism. There's a lot of weirdness to talk about there. So the idea of the underworld also being a reference to the deity wouldn't be that strange because we saw it in Greek alongside the same time as the Canaanites and this wouldn't be different than, say, Mot or Arishkegal or Nurgle. Um, So there's an argument there, although this is interpretation. So both the place of the abode of the dead and the deity that rules over said abode of the dead. Ooh, yoy. So Gehenna, to get back onto the point a little bit, was a uh, ravine south of Jerusalem. And this is the ground where the children were sacrificed, the alleged child sacrifices, to Moloch. So this particular place has a very dark aura or history about it, allegedly, right? Which is is all history, so it's very contended. Um, So this valley is also a dump for the city, a historical dump where they would burn all of this trash. 
So it's just a not a very nice place, you know, full of garbage and potential ancient blood sacrifices. So it would seem fitting, you know, to have this really bad place and give it the name of that really bad place because that's something that you can immediately observe. That's not a good place, and we need an idea of, a, of, a, of an afterlife that is not a good place. So we'll call it Gehenna and see it has a real root to it, you know, an observable root in the, in the real world, so to speak. The Valley of Hinnom, translated into Greek as Gehenna. So let's talk about Hades because this, this is a lot to get into because in the same way as Helheim and Hell of Christianity is not a good translation, so with Hades is not a good translation between the two. So again, Hades is both the deity and the place, but when we say the place, it's a very broad realm. There are many places within the realm of Hades. It is not just a wide swath, there it is. No, there's many details to get into canonically through, through uh, Greek pantheism. And it was seen as on the other side of the sea, right? And the other side of the world, underneath the earth, you know? And so, again, we're talking about the underworld, as I tried to carve out the idea in the beginning. So where there is the brightness of Mount Olympus and the higher ethereum of the gods, there is the opposite, which is the darkness of Hades, you know, entrusted to the brother of Zeus, right? And this is the place where all people go. Everybody goes to Hades. The common grave of mankind is the quote. And this would, you know, carry over, of course, to Pluto and to the Romans. And, and who would go down there? Well, there's the stories of Persephone and Demeter, along with several other stories of, say, like Dionysus. And we've gone over that some, you know. Um, you know, this is a secret place a place that is secret, that is hidden, which goes back to the hell reference earlier, and it, you know, across the ocean. So if you sailed far enough, it would seem that you would get to the other side. And some, it was oft, often put that if you could find these secret caves in the earth, you know, if you could find these deep lakes and get to the bottom of it, that you would have entrances to the underworld, to Hades itself. And so when somebody dies, let's just play this out again, you know, somebody dies, what happens? Well, their body hits the ground, you know, and then it, it soaks into the ground. Given time, it goes into the ground, so it doesn't take any creative imagination to say that that person goes to the underworld. I mean, it's, it's plain. <sighs> and obviously it would seem to be a shadowy place because if you try to dig a hole, it's dark down there, you know? The only light is from what is above, right? Right? But that gets a little conflated because if it's on the other side of the world and the sun goes into the underworld, then that would seem to say that it's bright. But if we think that the underworld is plainly just that which is below our feet, then of course it would seem to be dark. And here in Hades, we're playing the contrast. We're playing the duality game because what is up above is very bright. What is down below must not be so bright. But this isn't a damning statement. There is a place where people are punished, yes. But there also is a place where people are rewarded. And we'll get to that. But as to the details, there are many rivers in the underworld. The one that's been referenced in the course the most is Leith or Lethe, the river of forgetfulness. This has been tied to uh, reincarnation um, several times over. That when you are set to re-enter life, you drink of the river Leith, 
which makes you forget so that you can plainly embody your new life and not remember all of your old. Now, in the Dionysian Mysteries, it was the aspiration to not drink of the waters of forgetfulness and to remember all the times of which you have lived upon the earth. But, you know, that's one of the, uh, like, ubiquitous rivers in the underworld. There's also Styx, which is where the gods would take their oaths. So this is the river of the unbreakable oath. So you plainly make your oaths over the river Styx. Now, people think that uh, Chiron, you know, usually is bringing people over the river Styx. However, it's more often the Acheron, which is the river of woe. There's also the Coctus, um, which is the river of lamentation. And then the Phlege, uh, uh, the Phlegathon, which is the river of fire, which would very adequately be brought into hell, right? But the river of fire is specifically the fires of the funeral pyre. So it is honoring the, you know, funerals. So, you know, if somebody is being transported to the afterlife on the pyre, then this is their kind of direct reference, right? It brings them straight to the river of fire. So it's not a damning thing. Again, it's not a damning thing. So you might think there is this uh, depriving, right? But then, and you might think that they're stuck here, but then it depends on the tradition that you're hanging out here until you're reincarnated, that you're waiting to be reborn here, or that you live a life here and then you're reborn. So already it's getting really confused that, that um, you know, you would not remember what you experienced here because you would drink from the water of Leith. So when they say it's a secret place, the secret is kept by this water of forgetfulness that everybody drinks. Um, <clears throat> So, when it comes to, you know, the ethics, right? We, we have two real things to pay attention to. You would be stuck in limbo, and you would not be allowed to cross the river into the Adamantian gates of Hades if you were not given a funeral or buried with the coins on your eyes or some sort of ritual that would have you embrace the afterlife, Right? So this is something we need to pay attention to because this is a holdover from ancient animism and most importantly, ancient Sumerian. Um, so, you know, it is only pulled off and you only move on through the afterlife if a certain ceremony is done by the living for you, which we also see in Egyptian, very seriously through Egyptian and mummification. The other thing to consider is this... Um, transportation, the ferryman. That is also something that we're going to see in ancient beliefs where you, you need to be carried through a process to get to the place of rest, to get to them. Also, the dog, Cerberus, at the gates, who doesn't let anybody out, allowing them to come in, but doesn't let anybody out, except for through the proper avenues, of course. The dog, as a guardian of the dead, look at Anubis. And uh, I can't remember the name, but also in Mayan, the dog at the underworld. A ubiquitous trope of the ancient world as it found its way into polytheism around the world. Now, that's just a curious reference. But, you know, also hell having gates is something that we can tie straight to this Greek mythos of um, Hades. But specifically, we are now moving to talk about Tartarus, which is the main um, source of this terrible hell idea. So Tartarus, this is where you are punished. This, well, not you. You need to be a bad person, you know? You need to have done something terribly off in life and that plainly people would want to see you here with how much of a, of a ripe bad time you were. 
So this would be exclusively for just the bad people. doesn't matter what you believe. doesn't matter um, religiously or if you took a kind of sacred bath or if you got circumcised, <laughs> any of these things. You would go here because you're just bad. And this is a punishment or a retribution. And that is Tartarus, which is within Hades, but is not all of Hades. Because there is also the Asphodel, or the Meadows. And this is for people who are very unnotable, who weren't really heroes and who weren't really villains. They didn't really do good or bad. And this is a place where they're just hanging out. They're just living another life, like in Helheim, where they will become shades or shadowy versions of themselves, but they're still alive. But then there is also the Elysian Fields. And the Elysian Fields is otherwise paradise. This is for the exceptional. This is for the heroic. These are for the really good people. And again, it didn't matter what you believed. It mattered what your actions were or who you are within yourself. So this is um, heaven, so to speak. But the meadows, the Elysian fields, and Tartarus are all in Hades. So everybody goes down. There are these different stratas within but everybody goes down. So this is a very different kind of story. Also, in this greater scope, the gods are also here. And so the Uranies and also Nemesis are these deities that uh, will first, uh, like, if you are wrongfully murdered, the Uranies will go up and avenge your death. So it's karma. So you have like advocates for you in the underworld, whether you are good or bad, that will do right by you in the living world. So there's a cross interplay between both. Nemesis plays the same thing. Nemesis is a retributive deity that is good and will avenge you in some way. Um, you also have Hypnos, Thanatos, Erebus, and Nyx hanging out down here. Now, what about Hades himself? Well, Hades' palace is great. It is full of the precious stones, because as you may know, the underworld has beautiful gems. That's where they come from. They come from the ground. And Hades got a bunch of them. And he's in a palace with a great number of guests at all times. There are the inhabitants of Hades. There are ghosts and beasts. But they're all, they're not having a bad time. And so it's a really elaborate scope, right? Very much not so monochromatic as the hell that is sold through um, canonical Christianity. Um, but, strangely enough, is using the name. So it would seem better, just in retrospect, if Christianity were using Tartarus instead of Hades, right? A very particular realm within Hades for those who do evil deeds, and, you know, in Tartarus, in the Greek mythos, you have, you know, Kronos in prison down there. You have Sisyphus. You know, you have Tantalus. You have these... They were really good at creating the specific hell for these characters. You know, um, Sisyphus rolling the boulder eternally. Um, it was a Tantalus whose uh, liver was being forever eaten. I mean, this would have been direct inspiration for Dante's Inferno and the body horror uh, would have come from the Greek mythos in coming up with how to torment people who deserve, you know, who have wronged in some way. 
um, this, this punishing afterlife. Um, if somebody is eternally going to be a bad person, does that justify an eternal punishment for them being an eternal bad person? If they are just innately rotten, then is that a moral thing, you know? If no matter what circumstance and no change could ever be had for this individual, is eternal punishment morally justified, right? And that's a different kind of question versus, you know, if, if you do not believe properly, do you, atta- do you deserve to be eternally damned, right? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, this is all just, we're getting into a little bit too much of the ethical end of this. So when I've now painted this picture of the Greek idea of Hades, right? Let's look at the ancient Sumerian, right? So with the ancient Sumerian, if you died, you had to have the right sacrifices and gifts given so that you could pass on to the nether world, which there were seven gods of the nether nether world. I'm not going to go through them all because what's important is Nurgle and Arishkigal. Arishkigal being the queen that really runs the show here, which is why it's curious that the Greeks took this and made it about Hades. Um, so what's interesting about this is that many gods are spending time in the underworld as well within the Sumerian mythos. And the moon and the sun will hang out there right? They go there when they set. Where do they go when they dip below the horizon? They go to the underworld. So you see that it's retained this idea in more truth, in more ancient history. You see, it's not a place of darkness, per se. <coughs> um, there is the story of Inanna passing into the underworld, which if you read through the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, you're going to get a lot of references to all of this, and you're really going to see this picture that I'm painting here. So Kur, Arish Kurgal, Kur is this underworld. Inanna goes to the underworld, and through the passing into the underworld, is uh, continuously stripped of her adornments, and is eventually made naked. And is through this story, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> killed and restored and saved by Enki. Enki goes in, restores Inanna, and gives the water of life, gives the bread of life, and she is restored and can only be restored and taken out if somebody is put in her place, which the shepherd, the shepherd. Dumuzi takes her place when she's not there. So who goes into the underworld here? So here's the direct analogy to the Persephone story through the Sumerians, which we also saw this story with the Polynesians, by the way. This is an ancient, ancient, ancient conception. So who goes into the underworld? Well, when things are fertile here through Persephone, the growth, right? In April, things start to grow. Well, in the other half of the year, when things die, that growth goes into the underworld, or Persephone goes to Hades. And in this same respect, Inanna went to Ner. And who takes her place? The shepherd takes her place. So when the shepherd, you know, when's the shepherd really at the helm of society? Well, in the winter. Because the shepherd is now bringing the food source for the people. So when it's not the fruits that are growing during the summer, it's the shepherd during the winter who's providing. So they exchange places in the underworld. Dumuzi, being the shepherd, takes the place of Inanna in the underworld, and vice versa. So again, this is... This understanding of what this myth really means ties to an understanding of the nature of things. And that is inherently animistic. And right away, it seems that I've gotten far off the beat here, because right, we're all supposed to be talking about hell. But as I'm trying to show you through all this, is that this idea of hell 
was a kind of derivation from what I'm talking about right now. The other side, (coughs) people not being able to leave it, being secretive, somehow turning into hellfire and brimstone. And nobody can leave unless their spot is replaced. And that's why this whole Demuzi, Namu, uh, or Inanna switching places aspect. Now, in this myth, too, when we see this with Persephone being kidnapped, um, when we see this story of the courtship of Inanna and Demuzi, we have to eventually, and we'll get back to it, pay attention to what are the inner esoteric allegories that are happening here. But for now, I want to do a digression and just talk a bit about the Celtic otherworld. Because when we're looking at Helheim, we're also observing a retained idea of what the afterlife is to the ancient shamanic past as a bridge between the ancient shamanic past and modern-day Christianity, right? And so with this other case, too, we can look at the Celtic otherworld and see what's going on. So the Celtic underworld has many names, but the translations call it the happy plain, the great plain, the other land, the land of the living, the land of promise, the land of youth, and the other world that which is beyond the ocean. And that a king that ruled on this world is ruling the other world. This is where you get disembodied spirits such as fairies that are interplaying between the two realms. When you are in an enchanted place, you are in a thin place that is the bridge between these two realms, the other world and this world. You can't have this world unless you also would have its opposite, and that's why it's other. So in another way, you could call it the underworld because it is a land beyond the ocean where the dead find their new existence. But you are in a great place in this other world. You enter it (coughs) at an appointed hour, which means it's fate. And there's this ancient idea, too, of the silver branch. What is on the silver branch? Well, it is an apple tree. The apple tree as a conduit or a fruit between the underworld and this world. So why are trees sacred? Well, trees are sacred because they exist in both. What is a... a, a What does a tree have underneath? It has roots, which resemble the tree itself. It's a mirrorment between the two worlds. So the fruits that bloom from certain trees are viewed as a gift from the underworld or coming from the interplay with the underworld. And the apple has this ancient magical aspect to this, this cultural uh, uh, sacredness. So when we see... Eve being tempted by an apple, the ancient reference is more akin to a fig tree. But since it's being appropriated through English, and since it's being appropriated through the Celts that have been appropriated by Christianity, now it gets substituted with the apple. Um, And then, of course, you know, Snow White. And the evilness of the apple is a cultural appropriation of how they viewed the apple as an artifice of the underworld or the other world. And this silver branch could be thought of or was thought of as your lead to the underworld upon death. It is the um, guiding line that brings you there. And the, the Celts called this the silver branch. More anciently speaking, it has been known by other cultures as the golden bow. B-O-U-G-H. As the symbolic bond between this world and the next world which is bringing me back to the subject of former mention, which is the trials of Persephone, the secret initiations of Persephone. If you look at Virgil and his classic poem of Sybil, there is all manner of mention to this ancient underworld initiation carried on by Aeneas. I'm giving you guys a lot of references here. So, the seeking of the underworld experience. You're seeking it. Now, what's this about? 
Now here's where we get to melt this conversation even more. So in order to become superseded, in order to transmute, in order to become a woke person, enlightened, what have you, through these secret initiations, you are choosing to pass your soul through suffering and through the underworld to see the other side. Now the suffering part comes in because this is a dark night of the soul reference. This is a destroying yourself so that you can see what's there in the wreckage pile. And this is a spiritual experience that you have within your experience on life, like in life. So you choose with great purpose to undergo a terribly negative time. Call this a Saturn return. Call this a midlife crisis. Call this an existential adventure. But through these secret initiations, you're choosing to go to a dark place, to undergo suffering, to undergo punishment of yourself by yourself, archetypally, in order to become greater. Now, what did Jesus do after being killed through the allegorical story of Christianity? He went to hell for three days and then rose and then rose to heaven. There is an alchemical story here. There is an esoteric story that speaks to the interpersonal spiritual experience in life. So you think that this conversation about hell is plainly about the afterlife when in fact what I'm trying to illustrate here is that it's been misunderstood because it was a section or a a segment of the esoteric spiritual experience of the individual. And when it's called eternal, it's because it feels eternal. The soul or the person is convinced that it's an eternal experience. And that's part of the buying into it, which alchemically transforms you into the next transmutation. This is getting into... (laughs) I'm getting it over my head here. But this is all just to say that this brings it back to this animistic idea of the ancient realms, this rites of Persephone, to go to both sides, you know, to be knowing, to forego the drinking of the waters of Lethe, and to be aware of both sides, the other world and this world, Um, the other side of the coin and this side of the coin in order to reach an understanding beyond both planes. And that was the real aspiration, the real spiritual aspiration. So, you know, with all of this that I've shown too, it's also a matter of the ancient shaman. The shaman would be interplaying between both sides, would be working with the spirits of the dead, would be working with the ancestors, as it's called, and the um, animal spirits and the intellectual spirits, depending, of the three different realms. And in that way, it's a wisdom beyond just this realm. It is also a wisdom that you learned through a suffering. You know, the shamanic sickness was a real deal. You had to suffer to acquire that wisdom. And so you find this ancient shamanic practice in the rites of Persephone, and in this idea of Hades and hell and the other world, the other side. Now, I also want to point out right here, I mentioned Dante's Inferno, but then there's also Milton's Paradise Lost. And within book one of Milton's Paradise Lost, he has a very telling quote said by Satan himself. It says, A mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. And this would be viewed as straight-up Christian stuff by whoever is looking at it. It it depends, I guess. But it's to say that this is all about mind, that this is all a mental experience, right? And that the hell thing is all about your mind. The heaven thing is all about your mind. And this afterlife thing is all about your mind. I feel like I can't dig that deep enough into people's heads when I say it. It's all in your head. Look across to the ancient traditions as I've displayed. 
The Celts seemed like they would be very content to die, and they were. In their battle practices, you see that they were very content to die. They were very confident about what it meant to die. And the same with the Norse when they're going berserk. And you look over at the native traditions, you have the concept of the happy hunting grounds, that you're on the other side, that there's abundant game, that there's abundant resources that you're tended to. It's basically just life on the other side. And if anything, in certain traditions, this is a harder time. This life is a harder time than on the other time, you know? But again, in these different traditions, as I pointed out, your belief has never been required. That's the way it is. And nothing about what you believe would change what is. But that's the weird implication here. Because if this is all mind, right? This is more of a subjective-rooted experience as opposed to an objective-rooted experience. Then if you want hell, you're going to have it <clears throat> here. And if you want heaven, right? Like, not just want, but, you know, there's something more subtle here that I can't quite put to words. Then you'll have it. But in these different beliefs across time, you'll see that this idea of this afterlife, this hell, is really a cookup of Western society. And it really took a number of things being further and further taken away from its ancient roots in order for it to be even considered a possible idea. And for one, just an idea, but then for two, to be taken so seriously that it changes what people do here and now. And that they lend it such heavy credo that it dictates the way that they interpret reality and their actions. And they'll say things like, you're going to hell. And, and then it's like, okay, what does that mean? And I guess that's the whole point of this whole session. What does that mean? Actually, because if we're taking it, taking it all the way back to the ancient, then it's the, the shamanic three realms through the world tree, the upper realm of the intellectual spirits and the ancestors as they are above, and the lower realm of the fey land, of the uh, perfect nature of the animal spirits below. And no suffering is anywhere to be had anywhere in this mix. That to become the ancestors is to become a part of the other side. And that there's no question here. It's immediately observable. And so in this underworld, in this other side, it has been ubiquitously agreed upon by the ancient world by sheer number alone that it's just the other side. That it's just another way. That there's the other world and then there's this world. And there's a jostlation between the two. And there's an interplay between the two. And sometimes you're here and sometimes you're there. That is more universally agreed upon. And then as we're following the story through Western society and we see it in Hades and then some slight deviations there, right, where it's all about the underworld and you're basically going to stay there with some exceptions of reincarnation, then all of a sudden we have this ripe dichotomy, you know, through Sheol into this idea of hell, where now it's a staunch... Uh, bifurcation of what is to be expected after life. Down or up. Good or bad. Quite, quite scathing. But so many things had to come to be to make that even feasible to our minds, and I hope that's been made clear. <sighs> well, I guess I'm done with um, hell for a while. 